Welcome everyone to this um, every two weeks sync, IPLD sync meeting. It's May the 10th, 2021. And as every week we go over the stuff that we've worked on and then discuss any open agenda items. Um, I don't have an update. Um, Eric, do you want to start with the update? With your update? Sure. Uh, I think I'm getting ready to unveil and declare that we have a new unified site for documentation and specifications and pointers to libraries, pointers to design docs, and everything else. This is the combination of content from the old IPLD slash IPLD repo, the old docs repo, the old specs repo, and a bunch of other stuff that have been just floating around. Um, in the notes document, I have a link that is on freak.co where I've been hosting the, the static site build and Fleek is kind of a cool service. I guess I talked about that in the past. It's still there. It still works. It's nice. Um, the source for this is in the IPLD slash IPLD repo right now, and it's on a branch called 2021 if you want to check out the source. So um, that is where that is living right now. I think this is getting to the point where I could say, please look at this. And sometime in the like now-ish future, we could talk about moving the DNS pointer to say this is it now. Um, but I have not ported 100% of the content. <clears throat> so the way I'm going about this is uh, in the source, there's an underscore legacy directory. And I put all the old repo content in there. And I'm basically deleting it out of that directory as I put it into the new site to make sure that I don't lose anything. Um, and there is a bunch of stuff that's still in the legacy directory, but like all the schema specs have come along, all of the codec specs have come along, um, a lot of stuff has come along already. So, and I'm going to just keep grinding away on that. But I think at this point it's more complete than any of the other things that we pushed to the web before. <laughs> the bar there isn't super high, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, so if you want to take a look at that and scream about anything that's missing, I think it's, uh, you can do that now. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Something that I have definitely forgotten. Um, yep, and I won't remember until it's too late. So <laughs> that is my main progress update. I'm really excited about it. Thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, we have questions. Yeah, I guess I can, um, this is somewhere in between question and update. Um, so as, as you may know, we've been spending a while doing uh, an IPLD prime integration into IPFS, into Go IPFS, and that is continuing to go along reasonably well. Um, we, in the last couple of weeks, um, were able to run uh, the branch that is using um, IPLD prime under the hood on some of the gateway machines that Vertical Labs runs and took pprofs of them and found that there was not any noticeable performance issues due to the use of um, IPLD Prime at the data layer, which was good because that unblocks the need for performance debugging at this stage. Um, and so really the only thing we're trying to get sort of finalized before we're happy merging this into Go IPFS and getting it into a release is the interfaces for how you access IPLD prime data uh, in IPFS. And the current interface that we're targeting is, um, there's a subcommand um, called IPFS DAG get and IPFS DAG put, where you put in data and get data out. Um, and, and we have these sets so that they can use um, IPLD prime codecs uh, as the data formats uh, on both, both in and out. And so one of the questions that we're still, that I think is sort of the only unresolved design thing in my head, um, uh, and that we're working with IPFS on in some sense is when you go to get data back out. So you've got data, it's in some format in the IPFS data store. And you say IPFS dag get, and you ask for it with, you know, dash dash encoding dag JSON. So you would like to pull it out and have it be, go from an IPL note, IPLD dot node that's been reconstructed and you get it. So right now, the way we've done that happening is there's, um, a sort of generic library that 
is in a separate repo for IPFS called Go IPFS Commands, um, which is the command line type thing that IPFS sends stuff through. Um, and so we have this as a, it, it, it already knows how to serialize data using Go's default serializers. Um, and so it'll serialize anything coming out of IPFS you know, as JSON, as XML, um, and it's got a few of these sort of serializers. And so what we added as our first pass was, if it's not one of the four sort of hand-built serializer things that um, this IPFS commands library knows about, um, but you specify either a codec number or a named uh, multi-codec that there is an IPLD prime codec for, it'll see if what it's been given is an IPLD node. And if so, it'll pass it through the codec and then it'll give you that. And so this means it, like this basically works, Like you can ask for the DAG JSON and it works and you can ask for DAG CBOR and suddenly you'll also be able to ask for custom codecs. And this is all exciting. Um, but one thing that's true is the data that's being passed to that commands library is not just DAG get data, but in fact, it's any data coming out of IPFS. And some of that data is not going to be an IPLD node. It's going to be an arbitrary struct of data that the default JSON serializer is using reflection on to turn into JSON. And so we're sort of trying to understand, should we take this fallback to, or this, this secondary use IPLD prime codex and make it only applicable on the DAG get method where we know what we're getting out is an IPLD node? Or do we want to integrate um, reflection work that I believe is being worked on so that when we're given some struct that is not already an IPLD node, we turn it into an IPLD node and then pass it to the codec so that whatever sort of comes out there, we can turn into an IPLD prime node and then we can serialize it in the format you asked for if you asked for an IPLD prime codec serialization. And so then, you know, the, the upshot is, okay, you got some structured data out of a direct IPFS get or something, and you'll be able to encode that as JSON or CBOR or whatever your other custom codec is, which is sort of interesting. Um, and you get the benefit that you've got IPLD prime codecs now at this generic layer where all commands get them, which is cool. Um, but is that what the reflection was meant for? And is that subverting this whole thing? So that's a question that uh, Eric maybe has opinions on and Eric and IPFS should come to consensus on, and then we will do the thing that the consensus emerges from. I became a little unclear about what, it sounds like there are some interesting boundary choices in those libraries, and... Um, there are. Yes. <laughs> so, I don't know what some of those boundaries are right now, and they sound very interesting, and maybe I'll look at them later. I, I doubt that the reflection work that Daniel's been working on is for that, or should we even be used for that. If, if we're taking... I, I became confused in your description how many serialization boundaries there are, and if there's several of them, then like we should remove structs and reflection from the picture and just use generic like basic node stuff and it should be fine. And if there's less than that, then I don't. I will admit to also being confused about this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I actually, maybe I should. I think it's this. because for all of these subcommands, we allowed them to both be accessed through the command line and over an HTTP interface. <sighs> It seems like the two big choices would, we should figure out how to have this transformation from going structs to serial things happen once, no matter what. And like, if currently that is implemented, if there's a bunch of features that have historically been hard coded as doing JSON for whatever reason, then it seems to me we would be safer from. I think that's a layer further down though. I think that's after the serial, the first serialization potentially, or, or in tangent to it. Okay, yeah, I got a lot of questions there. Um, what, what 
I don't really get it. We're talking about DAG get, right? Like, why would you get something that is not IPLD? Or is when it you like DAG get how... it, it's always IPLD. Well, the same, they're, they're yeah. wondering if to try to use some of the same style of code for other IPFS star commands that have a dash dash encoding flag, right? Did I understand it correctly? All IPFS dash dash commands have a encoding flag. Right. Oh, I see. Okay, so now I got it. Okay. So that flag just yes. not work on some of them currently? Or like, what's the state of that? <laughs> Well, any command that is outputting output. Because the output from the actual command flows through the IPFS commands library, which then encodes it. But it, So is it doing, like, does something get serialized and then, like, bounced back and then serialized again? No. Okay. I have questions, and... Because, because it's still, when we're doing it on the command line with dag get, it is an IPLD node. It has not been serialized and recreated. Um, it's the direct node, right, that, that it gets. It gets the direct thing that the actual command chooses to output. But it is one of two options, which is, or I'm using it in one of a few different ways it can be used. Because the commands, when accessed over an HTTP interface, will not be going through this IPFS commands, which is how a direct CLI accesses IPFS. But instead you have uh, IPFS HTTP API that does its own serialization of stuff over an HTTP wire. And then you have a files client that either exposes uh, as a separate process that's consuming IPFS over an HTTP API, another Go library, and does a secondary serialization there or, um, you can have a direct thing that gets a, that like there's a light client that talks to the real IPFS over an HTTP API for cases where you've got a long lived daemon process separately from the one that you're using to interact with it from the panel. It seems like if there isn't a design document saying where the one place is that the serialization is implemented, there should be. And that would be step one. <laughs> okay. Uh. So, but should that involve, should that involve Daniel's reflection thing? No idea. Yeah. So to give topic switch to this um, reflection thing that Daniel has been working on, um, I forget how much we introduced that in the previous calls. I guess that, okay, that probably started since the last time we had a bi-weekly call. Things moved fast. Um, Daniel, who's not here in this call right now, started working on an implementation of the Go interfaces for Go IPLD Prime to make a node which is implemented using Golang reflection. So you can sort of bind it to your own implementation of like however you want to define Golang structs and you want to morph them into nodes, you can do it. And so this is uh, going to be a third major way to make nodes. So the options you've got right now is there's this basic node implementation, which is general purpose, but not efficient because it just uses like untyped maps and lists. And you can use the code gen, which is super efficient, but then you're using code gen and the barrier to entry there is like substantial. Um, and so this is gonna become a third option where you can write your own Golang types or take ones that you had already written and um, using reflection or possibly even struct annotations that happen to power reflection later, the library might see that we'll see how it goes. Um, use your own Golang structs and get nodes out of it. So it'll be a lot closer to what Golang standard library JSON works like. And it'll probably have like radical. Do you need more. tags? What, what are the, what, what would you be using tags for? Um, we don't need tags. I don't know. Um, so there's also previously we've had the refund library, which let you do all the configuration for how to map struct into something that is functionally the precursor of IPLD nodes, but wasn't called that. Um, and that library let you do all this stuff programmatically. So if anyone has seen that, we could do that approach again. Um, but tags and having the library infer a bunch of stuff for you is also 
often practical. Um, we can do both. I don't know how this is going to go. Um, but it'll be an alternative to code gen and an alternative to using the slow general purpose thing. So this will be, this is something that I'm very, very excited about. <laughs> um, and I don't know if I want to report on the progress bar too much since the person doing the work is not in the video call, but we've been talking about it a lot and it seems to be going well. Um, I think the current implementation handles all of structs already, basically. Um, and this will be kind of fun to document, I guess, because there's the Golang concept of struct and then there's the IPLV schema concept of struct. And I believe that we are still using the schema language a little bit to configure some of the mapping parts. So I have two different meanings of struct, fun. Um, I think Golang struct, which maps to schema struct, is implemented. And uh, most interestingly, passing tests. It turns out that the test that we have for the cogen stuff is successfully being reapplicable to this new work. So like, I'm really happy about that. <laughs> I tried to do that and wasn't sure that I succeeded. Really glad it's working. Um, so when we say that things are spec compliant and like feature matching the code gen, we'll actually be reasonably confident. That'll be nice. Um, the last I heard, he's still working on the unions and uh, He's optimistic that that's going to go really fast, and I am not because unions surprised me with how complex they were when I did them in CodeGen. So we'll see. <laughs> Maybe it'll be easier the second time. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but there's exciting stuff on the horizon anyway. Cool. Um, anything else? I think that's all I've got. Cool. Then, then um, I close the meeting. So goodbye, everyone, and see you again in two weeks.